we were considering in our last study how God has given us his son as an example for us to follow in the area of humility. Sin came into the world, into the universe originally through the pride of Lucifer who became Satan. And salvation came through the opposite of that, through Jesus humbling himself. Now, we may not realize how important these two things are, pride and humility. But the Bible does not say that God is opposed to the adulterers or the murderers or the thieves or those who are jealous or liars, but it does say God opposes the proud. If there's one group of people on earth whom God opposes the maximum, it is those who are proud. And you see that in the attitude of Jesus to people whom he met on the earth. You never find him condemning the woman caught in adultery. He said to her, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda who had sinned and as a result become sick and lame for 38 years, Jesus didn't condemn him. He healed him and said to him in John chapter 5 later on, don't sin anymore because otherwise something worse will happen to you than what happened now. But he didn't condemn him. There was a thief on the cross who had probably been a murderer and a decoit and thief for so many years. Jesus didn't condemn him. He said, sure, I'll take you to paradise today because I see you've repented. Here's another case of a woman in Samaria who was divorced five times and who was now living with a man, not even married to him, her sixth husband. What would you do with such a woman? Would you ever think that God could use such a woman? And yet what you read in John chapter 4, is that Jesus sat patiently with this woman and talked to her about worshiping God. He won her heart. I'm sure he drew her away from that life of sin by showing sympathy and compassion for her, which she never experienced from anybody else in Samaria. Why do you think that woman in John chapter 4 came to draw water at noon? Nobody in the villages goes to draw water at noon. They all go early in the morning. The women go to the well early in the morning because they need water for the whole day. At noon, nobody goes there. And Jesus was all alone at the well at noontime, prompted by the Holy Spirit to sit there. And this woman comes along at noon because she had been the butt and the ridicule, ridiculed by all people in Samaria that she did not want to go to the well when all the other women were there. She wanted to go when nobody was there. And she was surprised to find Jesus. And Jesus never condemned her, encouraged her, drew her away from her life of sin and sent her back into the city of Samaria to bring about the greatest revival that's described in the Gospels through the ministry of anyone other than Jesus. None of the apostles could produce such a revival as this five times divorced woman went and produced in the city of Samaria. So many people came to Jesus and said they believe in him. And it says there they believed in him because of the testimony of this woman. So that's how Jesus was. He never condemned any of these people. But now, look at the way he spoke about the proud Pharisees. The Pharisees were the people who, when they went to pray, they would look down on others who they felt were not as good as them. Like many Christians today who look down on people in other denominations and look down at other believers who they think are not as spiritual as they are because they've got some understanding or some experience which those other Christians don't have. Christendom is filled with such arrogant, conceited snobs who call themselves Christians who are actually closer to the devil than they are to Jesus Christ because of their pride. Those, in the days of Jesus, such people were called Pharisees. 
self-righteous, proud, looking down on others. And Jesus had the strongest words of rebuke for them. He called them a generation of vipers. He called them snakes. He called them a full of dead men's bones curried, covered over with a beautiful tomb. He said, you're, you're like a person who's got a cup all clean on the outside, but dirty inside. He said, how will you escape the damnation of hell? For whom, to whom did Jesus speak such words? To people who were religious, who went to the synagogue every Saturday, who knew their Bibles, who prayed, who fasted, who tithed. But they had one big serious problem and that was the sin of pride. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So pride and humility are very serious. Humility is the ground from which all the other virtues of Christ can grow. Have you noticed in Galatians 5 and verse 22 and 23, where the fruit of the Spirit is described. Humility is not even mentioned there. Isn't that surprising? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. Why is humility not mentioned there at all? Because humility is the ground on which this fruit grows. You cannot get grace from God. Grace is like the rain that falls on this ground to produce the fruit of the Spirit. You can't get that rain of grace unless you're humble. God gives grace only to the humble. And this is so important because this primary message of the new covenant is that we can overcome sin. Jesus came into the world to save people from their sins. Why is it then the vast majority of Christians are still defeated by sin. Why is it the vast majority of Christians, if they're honest and you ask them, they'll tell you they're still defeated by anger. They still lust with their eyes. They are occasionally jealous. They still love money, many of them. They are bitter and they have bad moods and they're discouraged and condemn themselves and all types of things. Why is that? I will give you the answer in one sentence. They do not receive grace. They have received grace for forgiveness of sins. We should stop there. The rain is not falling on their ground and so the fruit is not being produced. Why is the rain not falling on the ground? Because God gives his grace only to the humble. And there's some pride in the lives of these Christians that is preventing them from getting grace. They look down on other people. So you see that humility is very, very important. It's fundamental. And it's very easy to be proud. One of the easiest things in our life is to be puffed up. To be proud of something God has given us or God has done for us. Maybe God's given you a good looking face. That's enough to make you proud. Or God's given you intelligence more than other people. That's enough to make you proud. Or he's given you a better job. Or your family is a wealthy family or in a high position. That makes you look down on others. And God is the enemy of all such people. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God is the enemy of murderers and thieves and adulterers, but he is the enemy of the proud. I picture it like this when it says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That if you are humble, God will get behind you and push you forward or get underneath you and push you up. But if you're proud, God will come in front of you and push you back and come on top of you and push you down. And there's no hope for you if God is pushing you back and God's pushing you down. It's better to have God pushing us up and pushing us forward. And he will do that for those who are humble. He gives grace. And the Bible says in Romans 6.14 that when a man gets grace, when grace comes upon him, he overcomes sin. So whenever you are defeated by any sin, whether anger, lust of the eyes, bitterness, jealousy, anything, anything, love of money, anything, you can be absolutely sure the reason for that is you did not get grace. Because if you got grace, sin would not have dominion over you. Romans 6.14 is very clear. It's as clear as 2 plus 2 is 4. 2 plus 2 is not 3.9, it's not 4.1, it is 4. 
And if grace comes upon you, you will have victory over sin. Nothing can stop it. Then why didn't you get victory over sin? Because you didn't get grace. Go one step further back. Why didn't you get grace? Because you were proud. That is the only reason why people are defeated by sin. Every Christian in the world who is defeated by any sin has to face up to the fact there's some pride in him which prevented God from giving him grace and that's why he's defeated. So what does he need to do? He needs to go before God and say, God, please give me some light on the pride in me which I probably don't even see. I think a lot of Christians genuinely do not see the pride in them. They think they're pretty humble. Some very proud people think they're quite humble. They're proud of their humility or what they think is their humility. You can be proud of your Bible knowledge. A lot of Christians are proud of their Bible knowledge. They're proud of their, the gifts of the Spirit God has given them. Any type of pride, pride in a spiritual gift, pride in Bible knowledge, pride in the work you've done for God, pride in a ministry, anything, pride in what you've accomplished, will always bring upon you the opposition of God. He will fight you tooth and nail because he is opposed to the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. And that is why Satan was, became Satan. He was immediately cast out. So we need to see the glory of Jesus first of all in his humility. He's becoming a man. And as a man becoming a servant of everybody. His whole attitude to people was. I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. That's why at the last supper. You know they had the custom in those. Uh, lands at that time <clears throat> to wash people's feet whenever they came to the house because the roads were dusty. People did not wear shoes. They wore sandals. And having trudged through dusty roads with sandals, I know how refreshing it is to wash your feet with cold water or warm water. And those homes, they had a bucket of water by the door, a towel, a basin, and a slave. In the rich homes, they would have slaves. As soon as people came, the slave would wash the feet of all the people who came before they went in to have a meal. But in this particular home where Jesus was having the Last Supper, Jesus had just taken the house. There was nobody there because he wanted to be alone with his disciples. So some kind person had offered the house. There was nobody there. There was no slave because Jesus wanted nobody. So the person had kept the food on the table and the bucket of water, the towel, basin, everything was there, but there was no slave. So all these disciples and Jesus come with their dusty feet into the house and they all see the bucket of water there. They, need, they know that somebody needs to wash people's feet and there's no slave around here. But they're all too proud to do it themselves. They go and sit at the table because every person is important in his own way. Peter thinks I'm the leader of the apostles and Matthew says I'm a chartered accountant and John says I'm known to the high priest. I can't stoop to these undignified things. Everybody had a reason. Somebody was clever, somebody was big, somebody was important. So ultimately, Jesus, he goes and takes the bucket and says, this, this is my job. I came to earth to be a servant. And he takes the bucket, washes the people's feet, and they all feel ashamed. This is the way Jesus ended his life. So many people in Christian work, when they come to the last day of their life on earth, they want some title, they want some position, they want some honor. They want to be the head of some organization, they want to be right on top, be a director or something like that. Jesus was no director. He was a servant, he was a slave. On the last day of his earthly life, we find him washing the disciples' feet. I want to ask you whether that is your greatest goal in life. Is it your aim that when you come to the end of your life, after having served the Lord faithfully for 50, 60 years, on the last day of your earthly life, you want to be found at the feet of your disciples, feet of the disciples of Jesus, washing their feet, cleaning away the dirt. Oh, how rare! How rare, how rare to find even among those who preach holiness and sanctification and all that, to find this spirit. Because people have not seen the glory of Jesus' humility. 
They have not seen his humility in the way he humbled himself and went down all the way from heaven all the way down to earth and all the way down to the feet of his disciples. He turned around and told his disciples after that in Luke chapter 22. He, they were discussing actually while all this was going on. They were discussing who's going to be the leader. It's amazing. There's such a contrast in the spirit of Jesus washing the disciples feet. And the disciples sitting around the table discussing who among them is the greatest. Who is the most important among us? That was their discussion. And Jesus said to them, corrected them and said, you are not to be like the people in the world who have authority over the others and lord it over others. Tell people what to do and do this and do that and do the other. No. He says, you must be servants. And then he says, who is greater at a table? The one who sits at the table and eats or the one who comes and serves and wash people's feet? You know, the one who sits at the table is greater. Well, he says, look at me. I, I'm here as one who serves. And he set an example. He didn't just speak words. As I said the other day in a study, in the Old Testament, they had teachings. A teaching, say, be humble. But here in the New Covenant, we have an example. Jesus says, follow me, do what I did. And so we need to see the glory of Jesus' humility here. I wanted you to see another example of his humility. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read about a time when Jesus <clears throat> cast out demons. There was a demon-possessed person brought to him in verse 22. And he was blind and dumb. Think of this. A man, I mean, being dumb itself is bad, blind is worse. And here was a man who was blind and dumb. And as soon as Jesus saw him, he knew it was a demon. He cast out the demon and the man's eyes were open and he could speak. A demon had made him blind and dumb. And the people were so excited. They said, this must be the son of David. This must be the promised Messiah. But the Pharisees were jealous. They couldn't cast out any demon. They couldn't heal any blind person or dumb person. And so their jealousy made them accuse Jesus so that people would not be attracted to him. You, we find the spirit even today in people whenever, they, whenever you see somebody who is more gifted than you and people are being drawn to him, you want to say something to tear him down. That's the spirit of the Pharisees. And so they said, no, 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 this man is casting out demons through the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, Matthew 12 verse 24. And they called him Beelzebub. And you know what Jesus said? He said, I say to you, verse 31, every sin can be forgiven and blasphemy, but not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And if you have spoken a word against me, the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. So when people called him the Prince of Devils, what did he do? He forgave them. Now it is not like this under the old covenant. In the old covenant, we read in Numbers and chapter 12 about an incident where the brother and sister of Moses, that is Miriam and Aaron. Miriam was probably 10, 12 years older than Moses. She was the one who saw Pharaoh picking up the little baby Moses in a basket. So she felt she had some authority over her younger brother. Aaron was also older to Moses. And they speak against Moses for a small thing. Like, why did he go and marry that Cushite woman? Now, it is none of their business who Moses married. And Moses didn't disobey any commandment by marrying a Cushite woman. There was no commandment in those days about such things. The law was given much later through Moses himself. Now, when Moses heard this, he didn't have any bitterness against these people. But God 
said, this is serious. How dare you speak against my servant? And you know what happened? It says there further down in verse 10 of Numbers 12 that Miriam immediately got leprosy. Immediate. It says her Miriam, her face and everything became white as snow. Suddenly it was leprosy usually comes very slowly. She became a leper immediately. Just for saying a word against Moses saying, why did he marry a Cushite woman? It's not such a big sin to say something like that, but to speak against a servant of God that was serious and God judged her. So when somebody spoke against Moses, they got leprosy. But when somebody spoke against Jesus and called him something much worse than that, Beelzebul, you know what they got? They got forgiveness. Have you seen something there? The difference between Moses and Jesus? The difference between the age of the law and the age of grace? This you see, there you see the humility of Jesus. He says in Matthew 12 verse 32, Have you spoken a word against me? I'm just an ordinary man. You're forgiven. He was not an ordinary man. He was the son of God. He was the eternal almighty God equal with the father from all eternity. But he lived on earth as an ordinary man. He called himself the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. That's what he was. And he chose to be called by that name. And he said, you're forgiven. And not only they, whoever he said, not only you Pharisees, but in the next 2000 years, whoever speaks a word against me, it's forgiven. Think of all the things that people have said against Jesus. In the last 2000 years, they have said he's an illegitimate child. They have said he's a homosexual. They have said he got married to Mary Magdalene. They have told all types of lies against him, insulted him. But think of his humility, that he does not pronounce judgment on them. From heaven, he could make them full of cancer, leprosy, AIDS, everything, etc. All of that as judgment, but he doesn't do it. There we see his humility, his humility in willing being willing to accept insult. When they spat on him, he didn't say anything. When they slapped him, he only said, why do you slap me if I've said what's right? But when they slapped him again, he just kept quiet. When they made him suffer, it says he did not threaten. 1 Peter chapter 2 says that. There we see his humility. 1 Peter chapter 2, when he was reviled, verse 23, he did not revile again. When he was suffering, he uttered no threats. He did not say, wait and see what I'll do to you when I come back as the judge of the earth. He never said that. He never threatened anybody. Proud people threaten others. They threaten those who work under them in their offices. They threaten their servants. They threaten their children. They threaten their neighbors. They threaten people all around. They said, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I can do to you, etc., etc." Jesus never said it. He never said, you don't know who I am. I tell you, I'll teach you a lesson. Nothing of that. It's only proud people who talk like that. Proud people talk like that to those who are lower than them in society. Jesus considered himself the lowest of all. And he said, you're forgiven. No matter what you say against me, you're forgiven. Do you see how rare it is to find the humility of Christ among Christians today? Why is it? Why, is Christ, why do Christians fight and quarrel so much even with each other and with others? It's only one reason. They are proud. And why are they proud? Because they have not seen the glory of the humility of Jesus Christ. They have not meditated on the scriptures to see that glory. If they had seen it, it would have changed their life completely. The Bible says the Holy Spirit can change us into the likeness of Christ only after we see it, after he shows it to us. If you refuse to let the Holy Spirit show you the glory of Jesus in scripture, you will never be like him. The first step, 2 Corinthians 3.18, is the clearest verse describing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And what it says there is, the Holy Spirit shows us the glory of Jesus Christ. And then, changes us into that likeness. 
So I want to encourage you, my friends, dear brother, sister, listener. Let the Holy Spirit show you the glory of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. And a good place to start is to see his humility in these different circumstances. When you read the Gospels, don't just read them as stories. But seek to see the glory of Jesus in the way Jesus reacted to different people in different situations. The way he reacted to the insults that people gave him. May God help you to see that. And may God help you and me to follow in his footsteps and become like him. God bless you.